and <clears throat> it is a little strange that there are zero attendees on right now. So I'm going to... Because we're still, we're in a practice session. We need to enter the webinar. Okay. So I'm going to start the webinar. Okay. Oops. Thank you. All right, we have people coming in. All right, we have all these people entering our webinar now, which is great. And we've got things exciting. going. It's always so exciting when we get started in a new webinar. <laughs> okay, all right. Always fun, always fun. I know, it's always fun to like, get it going. Okay, I'm going to actually go ahead and share my screen. All right, folks. We are getting ready to get started. All right, it's 12.02. So I'm going to go ahead and kick this off today right now. So thank you. Let me, again, my wonderful friend just said, make sure we're recording. We are recording and we are ready to go. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for Procurement Harmony, Unveiling Strategies for Success in 2024. My name is Shannon Krebs. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Orchestro. And it's interesting, we say this is Strategies for Success in 2024, because I just realized we're almost halfway through, which is a little crazy <laughs> to be that far. But here we're going to talk about the um, latest insights from Hackett that we've been seeing. Um, Hackett, uh, Kate is going to talk through things and what we're seeing in terms of the top, top focuses, including optimizing spend reduction, ensuring supply continuity, and mitigating the impacts of inflationary price increases. And our friend Dirk from Provisor is going to talk about how they're tackling these challenges head on by leveraging predictive procurement orchestration. So we want to make this webinar as interactive as possible. We're live right now. There will be a recording of this later. So please feel free to put questions in the Q&A and say hi in the chat. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from. So feel free to keep things going. Uh, I'm going to just whip through some of this pretty quickly for us in terms of letting you know who we have here today. And they're going to be doing most of the talking. So I'm starting right now, but they're going to pick it up. But we have um, Dirk, who's the Director of Global Strategic Sourcing at Provisor Technologies. We have Kate, who is the Senior Director of Procurement and P2P Advisory at Jacket. And then there's me, who is VP of Marketing again at Orchestro. And we have a couple of slides just to tell you about these organizations, but we don't want to spend too much time on kind of the who we are. We want to jump into the goal of our discussion today. And the goal of that discussion is really talking about what the current procurement landscape looks like, the priorities that procurement is facing, um, how Provisor Technology has really embraced AI uh, and digital transformation to kind of head on these challenges straight on, and really overall lessons learned. And we thought it would be fun to kind of kick it off with a poll. So let's try our poll. Dun, 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 dun. Oh. <laughs> I know, I say that, and now, oh, let's say going back, a poll to talk about. Too far. This. <laughs> I know, and now my poll isn't there anymore. So we were going to have a poll <laughs> that was going to talk about your top priority. What do you guys think about this? And asking people, like, what are you seeing yeah. today? Maybe they can use the chat. Yeah, yeah good talk idea. Into the chat, what everybody's thinking. But I, I always try to guess. Every time we do a poll, I always try to guess what's good, what's the, the top winner is going to be, and I'm always wrong. So I don't know. I, I do want to say cost savings because, you know, that's based on the Hackett's research, what we're seeing. But again, very curious to hear from the audience. And Dirk, do you want to try to do any predictions? I mean, cost savings being in procurement, you cannot go around that, of course, uh, with the supply chain issues the last couple of years. Supply continuity is very important also. Without supply continuity, you cannot have cost savings. Uh, the digital transformation, I mean, everyone is jumping on the bandwagon, of course, with AI. And yeah, we have to do more with less. So I think it's going to be very close, but I think cost savings will be number one. I was yeah. going to 
interesting. We're seeing some things like supply continuity, cost savings. For some folks, we're getting chat disabled. So I'm really sorry about that. We'll see what we can do about it. Um, but yeah, it's been kind of an interesting view of what's going on. Yeah. So, well, it's, oh, go ahead, Shannon. No, you go ahead, Kate. I was just going to say, um, if we look at the top 10 uh, priorities from procurement perspective, um, so if you're familiar with Hackett, um, you're familiar with our research. So every year we uh, survey CTOs and global procurement leaders trying to get an insight around what is the top priority for upcoming year. And at no surprise, you know, spent cost reduction is the front runner, right? It's the number one top priority, priority that was indicated by the global CPOs and procurement leaders. Um, number two, supply continuity, right? So again, we've been dealing in, with so many supply chain disruption issues. So supply continuity is the number two uh, priority. So again, um, we are seeing a lot of that in the market right now. But one of the questions that we often get, well, what are procurement organizations are doing around it, right? How we are focusing on and actually getting that spend cost reduction under control, how we work, how we fixing our supply continuity issues. And what we're noticing is that organizations are really leaning into technology, right? So again, we're seeing still, you know, uh, focus on digital transformation and really focus on creating that modern procurement landscape from a technology perspective. So obviously it's not one, it's not one of the tactics that we're seeing, but it's one of the biggest ones that, that we're seeing the focus is, is, is being um, on right now. And if we look at, um, if we look at the uh, next slide in terms of uh, the, uh, you know, priorities and the workload that we're seeing, right? So again, procurement workload had increased and been growing year over year for the last four years, right? So we've seen numbers of 8%, 10%. So this is a consistent growth in terms of the expectations that we, from procurement perspective, that have, have to commit to. Uh, but what we're also seeing is a productivity and efficiency gap. So we're not seeing increases in FTEs. We're not seeing increases in budgets. So again, the expectation is to do more with less. Um, another trend that we've, that we've been seeing and noticing is the spend on technology, right? So again, um, this year, the spend has slowed down a little bit, uh, but still at a pretty healthy rate of 4.6%. 4, 4, 4. So what does this tell us? It tells us that procurement organizations are really trying to fit that productivity and efficiency gap with the technology, right? And what type of technology? Uh, if we look at the next slide, we're really going to see the types of things that organizations are spending on, right? And if you historically think about what, uh, you know, big end-to-end -end digital transformations, ERP, e-procurement implementations in the past couple of years, well, so right now, organizations are focusing on optimizing their ecosystem. So they've implemented these big tools They've stabilized it. Now they're looking at, okay, well, where can we fit in and more of a specific fit for purpose technology? So we're seeing a lot more span analytics uh, deployments and piloting going on. CLM is huge as well. Um, and e-sourcing, right? Digitizing and, um, you know, automating your e-sourcing or sourcing execution, your go-to-market activities, brings tremendous amount of benefits from efficiency and effectiveness perspective. But I know, I know I've been talking a lot around kind of the state of the union of procurement from a macro perspective. And I know Dirk, you've had some great success and you have a really amazing story. So if you want to talk a little bit about what you've experienced, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah, so I came on board with that provider a little bit over a year ago. And we had an, uh, an agreement in place with Arkestro for other portfolio companies. And when I heard about it, I jumped on the opportunity and met with uh, CCI, CC Industries, our uh, mother company, and yeah, inquired, what is Arkestro all about? 
the current state is, uh, yeah, we have a customized ERP in place. Uh, it's a little bit clumsy, as everyone knows. And yeah, to fight the supply chain challenges, uh, the, the pay to pay where you all use it for and infl inflationary cost pressures. Uh, we had then an orchestral platform to be able to test it. Uh, I jumped on it and started to change management at our largest facility. Uh, we are a global company with manufacturing uh, facilities in the US and Europe, uh, headquartered in Chicago and then. So yeah, we started at the mothership and then we did it some uh, testing. So collaborated with the lead buyers and our incumbent suppliers and did some uh, test, uh, test pilot campaigns. Yeah. Next slide, please. So yeah, when I came on board, uh, time to value is then uh, very important. The first 100 days when you come on board, understand the company, where are the opportunities, and then also get quick results. And that's exactly what we were able to do, to be able to do with the orchestra, uh, getting meaningful uh, savings, and then measurable financial outcomes that we are able to show executive leadership in a short, short time frame. So we saw an ROI within 60 days already. Uh, our quality of the data to run those campaigns, direct materials is a uh, very good quality. Uh, indirect, we did some indirect campaigns also, need a little bit of cleaning, uh, but it was not too bad. And yeah, we started then running the campaigns. It's very impressive, very impressive. Um, and in terms of what we're seeing in the market, right, so similar to what Dirk here mentioned from the benefits, um, there's a number of hard benefits that we're seeing from um, these uh, e-procurement tools and procurement technology in general. And really, you know, the, the bulk of it is around the effectiveness of the teams, right? So it's no longer the times where you're sending spreadsheets and sending, you know, PDF and Word documents to suppliers. You're really enabling that more of a pragmatic type of a, an ecosystem, right? You're also seeing a lot more improvement uh, from the spend under management perspective, right? So again, right, you're gaining efficiency, you're getting, getting more control over your spend and reduction in the maverick spend, right? So again, these are some of the financial hard benefits that we're seeing on top of, you know, some of the, you know, FTE improvements that, 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 that were noted as well. If you look at the softer benefits, so uh, if on the next page, you will see more of the softer benefits that are being noted. And really, it's all about standardization of the process, right? So again, when you standardize the process, you're able to scale, you're able to cover more ground, you, you can uh, cover more events, right? And if you look at the um, non-financial benefit realization, so we're seeing 83% of organizations that are either meeting and exceeding their expectations from getting better standardization of the process, right? We're also seeing quite a bit of improvement in data analytics and insight, right? Going, if we go back to our top, top two CPO priorities around, you know, spend cost reduction and supply continuity. So again, a huge enabler of that is having the data analytics uh, capability, right? So ability to see that and you can manage more, more spend, you can manage your risk better when you have that uh, ability from, from, from getting those meaningful insights from, from the information that you're gathering. Um, some of the other uh, benefits that we're seeing, right, it's just really empowering and enabling your category managers and your sourcing managers to be more effective, right? So you're taking away a lot of cumbersome work and just you're focusing more on kind of on the key core steps in a standardized way. Um, supplier experience, right? You never want to be that procurement organization that suppliers are dreading to work with. I'm sure we've all heard of those. Hopefully we're not one of them. <laughs> but really, it really helps suppliers experience a more streamlined process. Um, and supply chain visibility, again, risk is number two priority. So we're really, really seeing quite a bit more uh, visibility in, into your supply chain, your extended supply chain from, from using these tools. So um, I know, again, I covered some of the non-financial and financial uh, benefits, but Dirk, maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what you have seen from, from your firsthand experience. Yeah, also the number one better standardization that was uh, very uh, 
important outcome of uh, the rollout of the program. Also, we did a, a global rollout. What I mentioned, we started at uh, the U.S. locations and then a global rollout. And yeah, it standardized our processes and also with our partner finance and the controllers. So now we have monthly uh, calls and validations uh, about the campaigns and the validation of the saving. Uh, yeah, so we created a single sort uh, system of truth with all the sourcing events. It has a very nice uh, dashboard. And uh, yeah, you can see what is in the pipeline. We have good projects coming up. It also forces you to do very good uh, spent analysis. So the, the quality of the campaigns and uh, the initiatives, strategic sourcing initiatives also went up. Also the, the volume, the large uh, campaigns. And then, yeah, what I said, we onboard globally. So that's also very nice now. We are a more cohesive buyer team now around the world. What is very nice. Uh, what you said, just don't beat up the suppliers. So we got some feedback also uh, from incumbents that really looked at their portfolio also. And over the years, we have very long strategic partnerships, plus 45 years. They grew with our company. Yeah, they took on parts that was really not in their niche. So this also forced them to look at their portfolio and they divested a little bit, but also gained new business, what was very good to hear also. Switching costs can be high, of course. If everything uh, works, then why switch? But we had an, an extra round uh, after the campaign that we went back to incumbent and asked sometimes, well, hey, do you uh, are you able to match the price? And most of the time they did. And so we stayed with our uh, incumbent. So yeah, a lot of benefits, hard and soft benefits. Yeah, I was going to say, this is That's Shannon, we, we will sometimes find that organizations, you know, we don't want to beat up on the supplier. Suppliers are partners. I often say for every buyer, you have a supplier. <laughs> you are a buyer for a supplier in an organization or you are a supplier as well. And we do find that those switching costs can be high, but there are times where suppliers are just not being asked to quote as often because people don't have the resources to do so. So in many cases, by being able to extend the scale of what you're able to do and getting more quotes on board, we find that even incumbent suppliers are more competitive with our pricing. They might not be the lowest price, but they do manage to come down some time. I remember that was one of the, I think, really interesting parts of this, Dirk, is that it's not always the lowest price that wins. Definitely. And another advantage also, the collaboration with the suppliers and uh, yeah, improve also. And still, sometimes you find out to hear from a supplier from, we can do this that we didn't know about. So additional opportunities. Yeah. So what were the results? So yeah, so we had some very good results. Uh, these are the actual savings percentage range between 11 and 37.6% even. The categories that we went to bid with that we had ran campaign for were machine parts. Uh, we glue. We also have an... Uh, a paper uh, plant for a uh, petty paper, for example, uh, corrugated and plastics. Uh, the 11% uh, that work for larger campaigns uh, in our aftermarket, they are managed uh, pretty good, but still good results. And then the less managed categories, yeah, the, the, the savings percentage increased over there. So yeah, we're very pleased. The buyers are getting very pleased about it also. And yeah, we are having great campaigns in the pipeline yeah, to continue this success. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think it's interesting because I think before, Kate, we had talked about how standard sourcing savings from Hackett in a previous survey were around 5 to 6%. So we often know that just by being competitive, you should be receiving some level of savings. But to be able to range from 11 to 37.6, you know, my guess is that that 37 is probably something that hasn't been sourced for a while. And so it's like, you're not going to get that savings every time, but you will get those like one-offs and be able to really see that range. And actually by, again, being able to scale to things that you haven't been getting quotes on can really help bring that value in to the organization. Yeah. These yeah, are some very good numbers. Business. Yeah, we created a new baseline and we got feedback even. You guys are rescripting the business. <laughs> what was interesting to hear. <laughs> So uh, there was another so another uh, quick summary about it. Then on average, it's twenty percent savings. What we did in our four campaigns, test campaigns, uh, there was around two point six million that we put through the system. Uh, but it's not just a software system that we subscribe to. There's a lot of people, great people behind the software. So the whole service piece from our tester is great. From onboarding and then still with the, when rolling it out, uh, they are available to do quality validation before you run a campaign. 
So it's really an extension of your piety. So doing uh, more with less, this is always, you know, this is very helpful for us also because you have an extra uh, extension of your uh, buyer team, your procurement team uh, that is, yeah, willing to uh, push the success of your company. Yeah. And if we, uh, so we were going to ask another poll. So right now, obviously my polls aren't working, but through the Q&A, not the chat, I know technology, it's been a while. Um, we wanted to know, <laughs> you know, what kind of, intelligent automation are people currently using today out there or the people are finding you know what technology is being used that's actually helping you accelerate your sourcing and accelerate procurement help you kind of really understand what's going on in the market so just curious if anybody wants to throw in the q a what they're actually doing right now I find it funny how we're talking about technology and our technology is not working. <laughs> I know. It's always the way. It's always, it, it also goes to show you need help yeah. with your technology sometimes to keep it going. So, yes. yeah, sometimes. Yes. But yeah, I've seen a couple. Um, oh, go ahead. I've seen predictive AI. What are you talking about? What, what are your thoughts, Kate? I mean, RPA has been around forever. So that's probably the most common one there's really you know a lot of use cases for it it's not tends to be like a permanent solution it's more of like a fixed gap um type of technology but um i, I want to see a lot more generative ai i think i think that that's the area that's kind of blowing up right now and we're seeing a lot of use cases and a lot of interest in that um obviously agile orchestration i mean Orchestra should know all about it. <laughs> um, I've been a fan of that technology for, for years now. I think that, you know, that kind of glue the single pane of glass that holds and enables all the processes together. Um, I think that's, 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 that's the piece that I, I, I'm a big fan of. But, um, but yeah, what, what are we seeing in the chat? Any, any, anything that's kind of standing out more than others? It's, it's, there are a couple of different things. So intelligent data captures coming through. There is some generative AI. Um, someone's actually trying chatbots, which I think is interesting to see how those will go. Um, chatbots are are often really interesting. It does require some time, mm -hmm. some real planning to make that happen versus a generative AI solution that can, you know, do that for you in, in the sense. Yeah. yeah. You know. Anything, anybody is using something that's not on the list? Like, oh, yeah. is, there, is there something that's not there? Um, but, but yeah, so in, so in terms of what, what does the research say? Okay. So from the research perspective, the RPA robotic process automation is the most common use case in procurement. Again, there's really nothing super special about it. I like to think about it as like a fancy macro or like copy and paste and steroids. Right. So again, it's a really great stop gap solution. If you need to create kind of quick integrations, um, but uh, again, it has to have perfect kind of data situation, and your process needs to be uh, absolutely structured and you know fixed, right? So you have you can't just throw RPA on top of a broken process with incomplete data. So you have to have that good quality data in that um, intelligent data capture. Again, this is. This is a lot, of, we're seeing a lot of that in like contracting and invoicing. Again, think about the OCR technology. So again, pretty, pretty common. Um, I think this, the, the, the one that we're seeing more and more is the chatbots, right? So we're calling it uh, con conversational assistance. So again, I'm sure everyone interacted with some sort of a chatbot, uh, good or bad, in, the, in, their, in their personal life. But we are seeing more and more of that uh, procurement virtual assistant, conversation assistant saying, hey, I need a contract. And then with some sort of also gen, gen AI uh, interface there as well. So, so again, um, you know, predictive AI is, is also big. It's good for uh, risk management. Um, I talked earlier about agile or orchestration. Again, one of my favorite um, areas but but yeah so the front runner is definitely rpa all the other kind of types of automation intelligent automation tools are getting there they're getting more and more momentum i would say if we look at this data next year we're probably going to see gen ai kind of being being more 
more dominant there just based on the amount of amount of kind of interest we're seeing, right? There's, you know, when we did a study across not just procurement, but across enterprise or from organization, from enterprise perspective, and we asked a question around, you know, are you focusing on Gen AI? The, the answer was, you know, over 90% of organizations are doing something around it. Um, when we looked at the data from a procurement perspective, the numbers were more 50-50. Yes, we're doing something. We want to be first or very close second. Or the other ones are taking more of a wait and see approach uh, to this area. But as you can see from current adoption levels, again, we're calling it intelligent automation, right? So this can your portfolio of tools that you can use to augment and optimize your current, you know, procurement ecosystem. So um, I know Dirk and Shannon, you, you guys talked about kind of orchestra's role in that, but I'd love to hear kind of what are your capabilities in this in this space? Yeah, I'll pop in here to talk a little bit about what Orchestro does. And while, again, we look at things like driving better outcomes faster at scale, uh, that's a way we like to think about things. Some of the key functionality that we actually do that really helps drive people forward to get some of those success is we use a combination of embedded data science, game theory, and machine learning. And with that, we, we do things like we help suggest a supplier. So as Dirk was saying, sometimes suppliers are looking through their portfolio, or you might not even know that those suppliers might be able to provide you something. So we look at your buying history, we understand what the suppliers um, can, you can procure from them, even if they don't always know, because they might not have bid on this particular item before from a location. We also come up with a baseline price. Part of the game theory aspect is we really understand that by um, suggesting a baseline price and suggesting a price, I'll go to this, actually jump ahead, baseline price. We start with a baseline price and we use our buying um, information. We use machine learning algorithms to actually understand what a proper baseline price should be. So we look at your buying history to see, oh, I've bought this before from these suppliers. And we figure out what is that base level that we should be at. And then we use suggested pricing to actually suggest a price per item per supplier which is actually really good because that's, again, part of this game theory aspect where we understand how suppliers have bid with you in the past. We understand how they respond during an event. Are they better to give better pricing on a first round or a second round or even a third round? And we will adjust prices accordingly per item per supplier. And that really, again, helps set this line of, of knowing where to start. And we know that by us setting the price, we actually provide some real clarity to suppliers as well. And we give them that clarity and um, insight through dynamic feedback. So every time they respond to something, we let them know, hey, you're doing okay right now, or mm, you're not really right there. And perhaps you should bring your price down by this percentage or this value. So we let them know what's going on. And again, it provides a level of transparency that they're able to see. And this intelligent automation is really the this whole process of going through it. So instead of having to manually figure out which suppliers you want, manually figuring out the price you want to pay, or manually even awarding, we can automate this whole process for you. And one thing that I think is really key is we have something called intelligent counteroffer. So sometimes we buy things that don't actually have a price because we haven't bought it in the past. But again, we can get a round of quotes back from suppliers and again, understand based on their um, bidding behaviors in the past or their quoting behaviors in the past, and just overall how we see events go, what a correct price should be. And we will reset that baseline and go out to suppliers with this new suggested price and say, this is what we really want to be paying. And again, we find again and again, this drives value down, um, drives value up and drives prices down from our suppliers. And again, it shortens the, the cycles as well, because no one's really guessing about what needs to be done. And Dirk, I'm just curious from you, were there features here that you, you know, tended to find more value in from Marquestro or what, what did you find really made a difference? So the game theory in it, it is very good. And then also the intelligence counter offer in the end, uh, predictive uh, price guidance. So it looked at all the feedback received in multiple rounds, and then it gives a final uh, price indication to uh, the partners and suppliers to be, uh, yeah, what, what's the market price at that time? And that is a very, yeah, uh, point for the suppliers to uh, do a final bit. Great. So if we 
look through kind of going through this whole idea of digital transformation and trying out AI and trying new technologies? What do you what did you learn through this process, Dirk? So Orchestra is a great software with a great team behind it, but it is it was something new to the company also. So it's change management then, of course. You have to come on board and it's it's the what. Huh? What's the vision? What are we trying to do here? And how are we going to do it? What's the strategy? How does it fit in in all the other uh, competing priorities within procurement or within the company? And then, of course, the why. Why are we doing this? Because I'm doing it currently this way and it seems like it's going to take much longer. So we really timed it also. And we were gaining benefits in the end. Uh, in the beginning, it was equal in time to set up a campaign in our ERP system or with Orchestro. But practice make master. Now we set it up much faster. Um, and then where, what I said, the prioritization. Once you roll it out, you have to start using it still, of course. So we created the success by creating the sense of urgency and yeah, create the partnership, internal partnership with our sourcing leads. And then what I mentioned, the service model of Orchestra is centered around the customer. It's really world-class, very helpful. And a global rollout makes it always a little bit more challenging uh, because of the cultural differences, the physical differences of uh, distances. Uh, we have offices in Europe then, time differences, et cetera. Uh, but what we're there, we're, we're creating that pipeline. And then, yeah, we continue the partnership with Orchestra. We are working with flat files at the moment, but we will start integrating into our uh, ERP system. And we are fortunate also that we are an active participant in the product roadmap. So we are really looking forward to the predictive and generative uh, features uh, that are being enhanced over time. Because, yeah, technology doesn't sit still. Yeah, yeah, overall, very happy, happy uh, customer. Well, we always <laughs> love to hear that. Uh, but I would say a couple of notes on that. You know, we're not making this a huge orchestra commercial for you, but we are constantly working and updating our roadmap. We work with our customers like Dirk to help us get further. But that first part about creating the sense of urgency and building your coalition, we find that that's really crucial. Um, we know that it's people process technology, but the people and the processes are really key. We know that change management is important, but our customers are finding, you know, up to about 16% savings on average within the first 60 days. But that's by moving forward and, and finding what is going to work and making it a project. You know, change management is really important. We talk a lot about autonomous sourcing, you know. Well, that is part of a category that we're in, but we know you're just not going to press a button and go that this is a whole process and project. We're not trying to remove your ERP system. Um, as Dirk mentioned, we can do standalone, but also integrating back to that system so we have a constant pool of data and understand it, as well as pushing awards back into your system can be really key. Yeah, and another benefit what I would like to add also is uh, new suppliers. If we did our quotes via the ERP system, and we wanted to add new suppliers. We had to go through the whole supplier onboarding process, a lot of paperwork, et cetera. But with Orchestro, you just add, you do your research before, of course, who you want to invite, but you just add the uh, email address and the, the campaign start running. You get an email and then the next step. And yeah, that's that's a great benefit also. Yeah, that's a good one to mention. We actually really do want to make this process easier for suppliers. Again, there are partners as part of this process. There are things like magic links so they don't have to log into systems all the time. There's quote by email that can allow them to just respond really quickly, especially if it's just a quick quote. Uh, you know, if there are longer, we all know what detailed bids can look like. Of course, there might be spreadsheets and such, but those can all be integrated and exchanged by email to make life a lot easier. So kind of, Kate, we wanted to talk to you about what would it be about exploring exploring these new changes in intelligent automation coming up? Yeah, well, really, I think the biggest thing is about being curious and open-minded, right? So we live in a very exciting time right now. There is, there's all these new technologies that are popping, popping out, right? So, so, so again, I think we've, we've kind of graduated from, you know, the e-procurement, ERP world. Now we're looking at, right, what are, what's out there, right? And in order for us to be open-minded, we have to kind of, you know, educate our stakeholders, educate our leaders in that area, making sure that you also have some sort of policy and governance around this, this, all of this new ecosystem and new technologies, right? 
again, um, and being very deliberate, right? Really coming up with use cases and say, okay, well, these are, this is my specific problem that I'm trying to solve, or this is enablement area that I'm trying to do. And, 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 and be open-minded around, you know, different proofs of concept, different technologies, right? What's best for me? Am I, do I leverage tool like Orchestro? Or is this something that I can use Gen AI for? Or, or is this more of like an RPA use case, right? Really kind of coming up with, with ideas, right? And be very open-minded. Uh, and then having a team around it, right? Having your you know, parts of your COE or having some sort of a virtual uh, agile team that is responsible for exploring these new technologies and, and seeing where can you introduce them and which part of your process, right? Um, and then, you know, then looking at it from, from your current supplier base, right? So you're currently working with different providers and having conversations with, with those and get an understanding of their roadmaps, right? And, and, and being part of that kind of overall conversation. But really, those are kind of the key steps and biggest one, like I said, being open-minded and also, you know, not be scared to fail, right? A lot of times these things, uh, you know, don't work and have that, you know, open-minded, open-minded environment where it's like, let's try it. If it doesn't work, let's try it again. So, so again, those are the key steps um, and uh, the, the, that we're seeing. And who knows, you know, change, changes happen in all the time. So we might have a completely different conversation next year. But, um, but with that being said, we'd love to hear from our audience too. Do we have any questions or comments or um, anything, anything um, that we're seeing in the chat? Yeah, I was going to say, I had a question that came through. Uh, this one's actually, I think for Orchestro, it says, is that data benchmark from other clients or just single client data? And so I think that's talking about our baseline pricing that we're creating. So we have it in two ways. One, when we're looking at overall, at creating a baseline price, we're looking at your buying history today. We're not looking at third party data or other, sorry, we're not looking at other client data today. So right now your data is for you, it is safe and secure. We're not using that to make buying decisions on a baseline price. In the future and on our roadmap, we are looking at bringing in third party data, market data, commodity data and such. Um, and that's on our roadmap for something coming up. Um, and, but then things like buying behaviors and buying patterns that we look at all of our data that's there. So um, to find out more, we'd love to chat with you in detail. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, let's see, are there other questions coming through? I'm scrolling to the chat and I see actually one here that is back to generative AI, Kate. Like I've heard a lot about generative AI. What are you seeing? A lot of interest, <laughs> a lot of interest. Um, everybody's kind of on on that conversation around what can we what can we use right where where is the, the best use case we're seeing a lot of that in the CLM space right so again enabling your contract lifecycle management uh, processes um, uh, having those kind of chat assistants right where you can go in and just say hey what's my spend in Bulgaria for marketing category. And get in that data instead of you go into your data visualization tool or a spreadsheet. You're really interacting uh, with with you know with a virtual assistant. Uh, again, the our use case library is growing. So again, this is from 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 what we know last week. I think next week we're probably going to have updated information from um, from specifically Gen AI use cases, and those are just few examples, right? There's definitely there's there are other technologies outside of just Gen AI that that can drive a lot of enablement and a lot of value, especially what Dirk described and Shannon what what, what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's okay. Yeah, great. yeah, we are very keen on the on the future on the predictive piece of it. So it will start looking then at the inventories at the min max levels and then start giving recommendations and alerts on hey you have to start ordering what and where and how uh, in the time frame etc. So yeah, that's that's very exciting. Okay. Yeah, in the end, if you can make it easier, better, faster, cheaper, then, uh, <laughs> then we're all for that. That always uh, works. Um, yeah, Dirk, and there's actually another one that came through you here that just asked about uh, what kind of changes in your team have you seen as part of the digital transformation at Provisor? Um, so 
everyone, what we said has to do more with less. So especially the buyers team, they do a lot of PO transactional work. Uh, so, but we are more into the direction of category management than strategic sourcing and category management. So really the quality of the campaigns uh, is getting better. They are doing more spent analysis and really yeah, look at the campaign from, hey, this makes sense strategically, getting new suppliers on board, et cetera. So it really, yeah, the quality uh, improves tremendously. That's good. Actually, Dirk, another one just came in and said, what are the disadvantages of AI in your business? I mean, in the end, everyone probably has the same fear, the, the security piece of it, of course. Uh, yeah, that's 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 a challenge and how yeah, you have to work with IT uh, to, to make that happen. And that's the policy piece that uh, Kate mentioned also. Does it fit in our policy and our framework? Yeah. But then once it does, then go ahead, start uh, <laughs> start testing, trying, fail. Don't be afraid <laughs> to fail. Start over. Yeah. I, I, actually, I feel that a lot. I feel like I remember at the showing my age here in the end of the 90s, you know, when we were going to GUI based applications or web based applications and everything was mm -hmm. web and internet and you had to say www before you did something or talk about being B2B or internet or in the cloud, you know, and we just don't say those things anymore. You know, it's just assumed. And I think very quickly in the future, AI, we won't say driven by, by AI. Again, we'll go back to what we're doing. We're, we're automating the sourcing yeah. process. We're creating predictive pricing for you. You know, we won't say AI is doing this for you. Yeah, now we're excited. Yeah. We have another pilot coming up also. That's also AI driven. So it's, it's we will, we will try to do it, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you guys, with that, I don't see, I'm looking through to see if any new questions have come through. I wanted to take a moment. I just put in the chat right now for everyone. If you want to learn more or be involved in other conversations like this, we actually have a link to our next Orchestra Advisory Council. These are great opportunities where we bring in um, executives and thought leaders to come in and we do kind of hear from a customer, hear from a thought leader, very much like this session. Although we do dive into product, there's usually a demo, and we talk about the product roadmap, but it's really an opportunity, and it's actually a Zoom that's open. It's not a webinar. We actually go like full bravery, and anyone can chat and talk at any point, and maybe that's easier since I couldn't get the polls <laughs> or <laughs> work this time anyway, um, so wanted to do that, and again, thank you, Kate and Dirk, so much for this. Um, it's been really wonderful having you here, and for everybody, we will we'll send out uh, information about this, as well as a link to the advisory council and a link to hear the recording. But again, Kate and Dark, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks everyone for joining. Okay, everybody, have a good day. Have a good have one. Bye-bye.